Welcome to Mikey Likes You People. Uh, it's everybody's favorite type of episode. It is the Q&A episode. Why is it everybody's favorite? Because there's less me, more of you, you freaking narcissists. Okay, let's not fool around. Let's get right into it. Uh, Ryan Bitt. What is one good move? Workout to help strengthen the lower back. Um, well, the best exercise to strengthen the lower back, ironically, is the thing that commonly hurts most people's lower back, and that is the deadlift. How can that be possible? Well, it is, it's very similar to alcohol. You know how alcohol can be one of the greatest stress relievers the world has ever known? It's also easily one of the most common stress creators. And it's dose dependent and it's based on the fashion in which you administer it. If you abuse or you are careless with the deadlift, it will hurt your lower back. If you are disciplined and have enough self-control to properly do deadlifts, it will absolutely bulletproof your lower back. Um, so take the time. Don't have such a big ego. The deadlift is the number one ego lift because you can lift pretty heavy weights right out of the gate. So commonly people just go, go crazy. Don't do that. Really have your ego in check and make sure that you're constantly and gradually increasing weight while keeping your torso as stiff as possible, engage the lats, keeping yourself um, in a position where you're not, <laughs> excuse me, where you're not, it, 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 rounding of the upper back isn't as detrimental as most people think. People see people do the cat pose, and yes, I mean, I in an ideal world, you wouldn't, but that really isn't what leads to most of the deleterious effects from a deadlift. What does lead to that is when the when the lats disengage and you're using, using too much weight to pull with a sturdy upper back. Subsequently, putting your lumbar in a position where you're going to hurt yourself, okay? So just make sure you're keeping that angle perfect. Whenever Whatever angle your upper torso is at when you are grasping the bar from the ground, it has to stay at that rate and move in an upper position completely proportionate 100 percent of the movement has to be completely proportionate with the angle that uh with your hips um it's a little bit hard to explain but just know keeping that low back in a position where it remains tense and the lats tight will prevent you from uh hurting yourself with the low back uh, in your low back during the deadlift um but on top of the deadlift i do think that what um the knees over toes guy a uh, guy I always recommend. He's, he's definitely got his shit together. He has been pushing this exercise called the seated hyperextension. Excuse me, the seated good morning. The seated good morning is a great exercise. I like good mornings in general. It's an old school, classic barbell compound lift. But it's very difficult to not do improperly. And when you start to progress in it, it puts you in a position where like other extras, like like Romanian deadlifts or straight leg deadlifts, where once you start looking for more resistance, you're you're almost guaranteed to put your lower back in a precarious um, environment. So the seated good morning takes care of that, and it actually increases hip mobility and uh, strength and mobility throughout the entire lumbar and trunk. Um, look it up; it's pretty easy to understand once you kind of. It, it's tough to tough to nail if it feels very foreign and it's a very new movement to you but if you do practice it and you can nail it the seated good morning excellent and also it's really scalable which is something else i like so if you're listening to this and you're a professional power lifter and you have a 600 pound deadlift you could go right to one version of the seated good morning if you are a total couch potato and you just want to get in better shape there's also a, a very easy tweaks you can make to it to um to do it right now it's completely scalable and i like that that's one of the the only real downsides to the most beneficial exercises when it comes to changing your physique things like the squat things like the deadlift is that you know if you've never exercised before man it's going to be months before any trainer worth their salt is going to want to get you to try to to develop those um, but the seated good morning go right after it i'm also a big fan of planks and even though planks generally you feel the muscular contraction mostly in your abs, um, things like planks and ab wheel, anti-rotation, anti-contraction movements 
these are great for putting your body in a better position to avoid lower back injury. So there you go. Um, Cosmo Moore, you live, thanks. Uh, forward slash underscore M. Is there any other compound movement besides bench press and doing push-ups for the horizontal push plane? Um, yes, um, those are two highly recommended ones, but take uh, the bench press and add its varieties and you have everything you need. What do I mean by that? Incline and decline. A slight decline on the bench press is is excellent and it's really overlooked um, because the standard bench press, I, I like it and all, but it doesn't necessarily give you the best contraction in the chest. And also it's really hard not to allow your shoulders to do most of the work, your front delts and your triceps. Um, and on top of that, it is responsible for many, many, many shoulder injuries. You can uh, really, really take yourself out of that position to hurt yourself in your shoulder by putting yourself at a slight decline. Um, and it really does actually um, engage a lot more of the pectoralis muscle. Of course, alternatively, work in some incline press. You're not going to be able to do as much weight, so what? Work them. Work them hard. Um, and then also the dumbbell variations. I like to use both dumbbells and barbells when it comes to training chest. Um, simply for the reason that I get a much better range of motion with dumbbells and you do feel uh, a bit of a better contraction when you're capable of bringing your elbows together at the end. It's pretty impossible to do that if you're holding a bar. Um, so dumbbell variations of the bench press and then also different angles of the bench. Ranger Ramon, what creates true happiness? Wealth, health, or love? I, I'm going to go with love. Here's why. Because you can have wealth without love and you can have wealth without health. In fact, some of the wealthiest people I know, in, especially in the entertainment industry, do not have love or health in their life. You can have health and not have wealth, but it's pretty hard to have real health, physical and emotional and mental, without love. It does seem to be, and the older I get, seemingly the more knowledgeable and noble I get, the more wise I get, the type of wise I, I don't, ha has no relation to intellect. I'm not, I like to think that I'm getting smarter from a pure IQ standpoint as I get older because I like to read and I like information and I'm a very intellectually curious person, but I can't sit here and say that for sure. What I can say pretty with with good certainty is that as I've gotten older and as I've gone through different experiences I've become wiser and how tight knit and how healthy your relationships are be it romantic and personal is so freaking vital to comprehensive health subsequently leading to your capacity to have wealth that I would say love is what should be the kind of common underlying theme of everything that you want to do in life. And that the more you make the decision to try to use that as your, as your lighthouse, you're faced with that decision, whatever it may be. It could be massive. It could be uh, very inconsequential. Do I like the red car or do I like the blue car? Now that I just saved up all this money to buy a new car, it could be that. It could be, I, I don't know if it really, really apply there. Let me think of a better examination of it. Do I work out today or do I take the day off because I'm not feeling too good and I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of lagging after a hard day of work? Or it could be something massive. Like, do I get a divorce? And if you just fall back and always say, I'm going to make the decision with the most love in mind. What can I do that I can, beyond a shadow of a doubt, look back on this decision and say that I use love as my guiding force that will solve a lot of life's problems? Now, there is no answers in life. There's no right or wrong. It's just something that I... that I've come to realize.
and it's been helpful to me. And one thing that I talked about in my last podcast, but unfortunately had to be edited out because of my shitty, stupid, idiot audio mistakes, all my fault, is that you can't overlook the love to yourself. I took a, I took a moment and I really analyzed the people in my life that are most important to me, my wife, my family of origin, my, of course, my daughter, certain friends of mine, they always treat me with love. Sometimes it's tough love, but it's always with this idea of what is going to be supportive and helpful and nourishing to my soul. Yet I have such a fucking hard time doing that to myself. Think about what can I do for me that's the most loving. And not in a hedonistic sense. What, not, what will bring me pleasure? What is loving to me? Be your own best friend. When I think of my best friends, what do they do? They treat me in a way that always makes me grow. And move in a positive direction. But I fucking, and I'm sure a lot of you also, don't do that to ourselves. Be your own best friend. Use love. Best workout for hunchback. Thanks, Quasimodo. (laughs) Seraf is H. I don't think you're Quasimodo. But uh, especially for gentlemen, um, we suffer from uh, bad posture very commonly. Why? Because... Uh, a, we sit a lot now in the modern day. We, we, we don't engage uh, postural muscles. B, because every single one of us had a poster uh, of Arnold Schwarzenegger or we uh, beat off to John claude Van Damme or Stallone, you know, especially guys my age. Or now, if you're younger, it's The Rock and Jason Statham. And so you go and you're like, I'm going to go fucking bench. And all your buddies are like, how much do you bench, bro? How much do you bench? And on top of that, you're like, I want to be able to see some fucking bikes. I got the guns. And you spend no time working on your postural muscles, your pole muscles. And you spend an inordinate amount of time working on your front delts and your push muscles. And then you end up like this. Super common. Um, The mid traps, the rear delts, the rhomboids. Work them. Work them. Go Google that. Find an anatomy chart. It's essentially the upper back and, you know, all the way through from the middle of your spine to to your rear delts here. Work them so they strengthen, so they have the ability to less, with less effort, be engaged and pull yourself back. On top of that, make sure to gain some mobility in the front part of your thoracic, being your front delts and your chest. Um... When I'm working on mobility in my chest, it's a little bit more difficult than the than the front delts, but um, I took this from Dante Trudell, better known as DC or dog crap in the bodybuilding community, and that is loaded stretching. I'll get into like a dumbbell um, lying on a bench. I'll get in a dumbbell press position, and I'll hold a heavy weight and just let it keep pushing, 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 pushing my elbows towards the ground, opening up my chest, and I'll hold it. Hold it so long that it really hurts. And not hurts in a bad way like connective tissue pain hurts my muscles like I'm doing a set. And I I just keep pushing and trying to go longer and longer and longer. And that helps, especially after chest training. I like that, that fascial stretching. It helps. Also, because this is something that I've dealt with pretty seriously, um, a shoulder dislocates. Take a broomstick and just work on pulling all the way back. I've also um, come to realize that a band works great for it because the closer and closer you grab the band, when you get it back into that position, you can pull the band apart to actually get it into the position, but then you stop adding resistance and the band pulls you even closer, opening up those front delts and you just feel beautiful stretch. Really work on mobility of the front delts uh, and the pectoralis and on top of focusing, taking time, really be disciplined about training the postural muscles, okay? Um, what's your warm up or stretch routine before lifting PB eight S I actually put up a video of this on this here YouTube channel that you're watching. If you're watching on YouTube and not listening, if you're listening, then go ahead, head to my YouTube channel and you will see, I put up a mobility activation and warm up routine for all the, the basic lifts. Um, I do not static stretch. What we mostly think of as stretching 
when you're getting ready to work out. There's conclusive and ample scientific proof. It not only doesn't prevent you from getting injured, it actually increases your chances of getting injured. Now, I'm not talking about you're getting ready to do gymnastics. I'm not talking about you're getting ready to do Muay Thai or Taekwondo where you have to kick real high. Boss Rutan and Lyoto Machida will tell you there is a lot of value into stretching before doing something like that. Or jujitsu even. You know, you want to open up your hips. You know, you're going to play guard. I, I get that. I'm talking specifically about lifting weights. Do not stretch the muscles you are about to train. Bad idea. It actually increases, slightly increases your chances of hurting yourself and dramatically takes away your power and ability to contract said muscles. So what should you do? You should activate those muscles. You should warm up those muscles. You should increase your body temperature. So dynamic stretching or dynamic mobility work is what you want to do. Move through a larger range of motion in the movements that you're going to do than you would. Uh, squat first is the first thing that comes to my mind. Before I squat, and I, I go to parallel slightly below, I don't see any value when you're training for progressive overload into going ass to grass. What I do see the value in is being able to go ass to grass effortlessly. So what I will do is I will do goblet squats and then move over to um, regular squats with just a bar, maybe 95 pounds, and I will go ass to grass and really sit in that squat position. That absolutely makes my knees, my ankles, uh, my hamstrings, my quads, and my glutes more capable of competently handling weight when I go to parallel or wherever it may be. Uh, Squat University, another person that I recommend greatly on Instagram, just did an entire video about it. Uh, I'll try to put a link to it where he talked about extreme ranges of motion, exaggerated range of motion. If you're a power lifter and you're consistently going to parallel in your squat, because that's all you have to go to, understandably, uh, and you're just going to touching the bench, uh, the, the, the titties on a bench press, great. Don't get locked in that position. Do practice outside of your training to really do dumbbell uh, bench press, like I was saying, almost you know in that fascial stretching style, to really exaggerate the range of motion uh, with the squat. Go ass to grass. If you can't go ass to grass, do whatever you need to do to be able to do that. I can effortlessly go ass to grass squats, and I do them pretty frequently. Sometimes every day that I'm not training, I will just do a mobility squatting routine as opposed to a get jacked and tan squat routine which involves heel elevated goblet squats which involves working the knees over toes split squat which involves lunges really slow really feeling my reverse not the leg that's working the leg in the back so that i can get my hip flexors to open up um squatting down like a catcher staying flat heeled and just squatting there and just hanging out pushing my knees apart letting my hips open up just so that you are really comfortable in an extreme, exaggerated range of motion, that will make it better for you to then go into the intensity range of motion, and it'll prevent injury. Green Ranger, you work out your vocal cords like you work out your body? No, no, I don't. Uh, certainly not anymore. When I was doing seven, eight hours of radio on top of broadcasting on TV every single day in my mid to late 20s and some of my early 30s, I did. Because it, I, it sounds so bitch made, but I would get sore vocal cords like I was a hardcore singer. And it's, fun, I'll, f f it's funny because when I was singing in bands like extreme music and I would blow my vocal cords out, I never thought about warming up. It's not something you think about because look. <laughs> when you dream I didn't dream of being Freddie Mercury I wanted to be Henry Rollins you know so it wasn't exactly like I thought of using my instrument but now I realize I look back and like Jamie Josta and Randy Blythe from Lamb of God these these men work very hard on taking care of their vocal cords and and I, I I'll never forget I remember quite quite um clearly uh this is probably 2008-ish 2007 um and AFI was playing at one of the K-Rock shows. And I was backstage hanging out. And uh, Hunter, Davey, all the guys in AFI have always been really cool with me. And they used to come on the shows, both Kevin and Bean and Loveline, quite frequently. So I knew them. And they were always real cool guys. Real cool. I like uh, all the AFI dudes so much. And so I was just like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm hanging out. And um, Davey, who's like really personable, was talking to me and... 
uh, we were hanging out, and he's like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 you know, doing his Davey Gaffney. And then all of a sudden, he cut out. Not like in a dick way, but he he's like, okay, give me that. And I go, and I look five minutes later. He's got like a boombox with a cassette that he has, and he's listening back and doing vocal exercises pretty rigorously um, to to this cassette that he probably has been touring with since the, you know, the East Bay days. Um yeah, I thought that was cool. So no, no, but I don't, but I have in the past, and uh, I think it makes a difference. Um, Kim and Saucido. Hi, Mike. Any updates on your hormones since the hypocrite episode? Just wondering if they are better, and what do you what do you changed to help with that food wise too? Um, no updates as of yet. I haven't got. I, I actually recently got my blood work done. Let's see, like two three days ago. So I don't have it back yet. But we will see. Um, the changes I made is I trained less frequently. I trained heavier. I went back. I, I almost completely um, removed isolation movements. Uh, pardon me again. From my protocol. And uh, you know what the problem is? I drink um, bubbly water, like uh, sparkling water, so much. More than, I, more than I used to drink alcohol. Like I guzzle sparkling water. And it's 104 degrees, not hyperbole, here in uh, central Texas today. So on days like today, days like it's been, I'm, I'm, I come in from, you know, checking on the chickens or taking the dogs for and I'm like, <laughs> and I just did that right before I started recording. So now I'm burpy and I sincerely apologize. Um, so anyway, I, I started training less frequently. I'm training three days a week. That's it. No matter how much I'm itching to go to the gym on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I'm training Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I am only exclusively doing squats, deadlifts, and bench um, with some chin-ups and rows added in and some some uh, more voluminous shoulder work. And uh, that's on purpose to, to really manipulate my hormones in a positive way. I don't want to do these long marathon sessions, and I also don't want to do too much volume, and I also don't do a lot of like potentially compromising um, anaerobic cardio, and I don't do any long marathon sessions by any stretch. And I'm not doing a lot of like bo- typical bodybuilding style uh, volume work, hypertrophy work. These are all things that have been shown to maybe negatively compromise or negatively affect your hormones. Heavy lifting in that, you know, three to six rep range of real weight where my my veins are popping out of my neck has been shown pretty conclusively to increase all the positive hormones. Uh, Another thing is I increased my fat intake and I removed a lot of my carb intake, not all. Another thing that is greatly misunderstood is that, you know, people think like a ketogenic style diet is great for your hormones. Upping your fat and your cholesterol, your dietary cholesterol is great. But a complete removal or even a really low level of carbohydrates is also really bad for your testosterone and your free testosterone and things like that. So I keep a good amount of really healthy carbs. I'm almost exclusively, no, I am exclusively eating fruit as my carb source and I'm getting a good solid amount. Even though I've lowered my carbs, I'm still eating 100 to 150 grams a day in fruit. Occasionally some coconut water if I'm going to go do, you know, squats, heavy squats and it's burning up outside but uh, that's about it you know and i i guess you could say coconut water technically falls into the category of fruit too um and i have remained using certain cruciferous vegetables but i don't like them raw i don't think the human body does well with them and i think we all have experience of eating like a certain salads you know raw vegetables and you go to the bathroom uh, four or five hours later, and you're like, there's there's my salad, I, that, all of it. So I will eat things like uh, cooked broccoli, um, and I've been also upping, making sure to up my shellfish. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. And then I've also, look, I've just gotten way more disciplined with my sleep. It's fucking crucial. We hate hearing this. It is that important. I, I, I will say this, and I mean this, and I'm not talking shit because I'm guilty of it as anyone. Don't DM me. Don't write in 
Mikey likes you, uh, uh, and Mike Catherwood Instagram comments during Q and A's and asking me about your training split and which fucking pre-workout to use, or if you want to get, uh, cyclic dextrin to have peri workout and how much creatine to take for how long. If you're getting five, four or five hours of sleep at night, don't fucking do it. Just save yourself the energy because until you can get a good night's sleep, consistently most of that other shit doesn't matter yes it's that important all right ah good question harry of foot for men approaching 60 uh what is your best advice towards overcoming being physically tired the hardest thing for me working out gaining muscle etc other than avoiding injury is the tiredness factor never had this issue in my 20s and 30s Now it's even more, now, oh Jesus, now it's not even drive or being motivated. It's pretty active, kayaking, hiking, yard work, etc. But how long I can do anything is the issue. If I kayak from 6 a.m. to noon, I have very little left in the tank the rest of the day. Substitute any activity in the previous sentence. It's so frustrating. Great question, Harry Afutt. There's a lot to unpack there. First off, if you're approaching 60, That's life. That's life. My dog Coco, I love her so goddamn much. But she's like 17, 18 years old. I I adopted her in 2005 and she wasn't a puppy. She's still alive and she's still doing really darn well. But 10 years ago, Coco used to run all day. She never sat down. She's running, 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 run, and she'd come in, drink some water, and then she would run, and she would bark at the stuff at the door, and then she would run, and then she would do laps, and she, would, and it never stopped. Right now, she comes out from under the bed for about seven minutes a day. Breaks my heart, but that's this life, man. She goes around, she checks out the yard. The other dog come over and nudge her and roll her over. And she, because she's blind, she can't see. She's, I, I, I. But that's all she's got. And I'll be very honest. Kayaking from 6 a.m. to noon would fucking floor me. That's six hours of kayaking. When I was really getting, uh, I want, I made a commitment. I was like, I'm going to be a, a good quality. So I'm never going to be on the pro tour, but I want, I'm going to become a good surfer. I was surfing every day, if not five, five days a week, if, if I couldn't do it every day. And, you know, two, three hours of being out in the waves, even if I only caught fucking three, I was, I was so tired that I was like 35. So don't. Sell yourself short. Some of the, the, at least what you described in your message sounded pretty fucking fatiguing. <laughs> Another thing is you have, to, this is, okay. I went to see the doctor, right, about my hormones. And not even this most recent time after the hypocrite episode that someone else mentioned earlier. I went to see the doctor maybe two or three years ago. And uh, he's like, wow, you're in great. They took my blood. I went back and he's going to break it down for me. He says, you're in great shape. You're in great health. And I was like, I'm not, in the words of Nate Diaz, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. Yeah, he's like, yeah, you're, you're, no, you're know, you very low body fat, great resting heart rate. Yeah. Um, but, you know, your body's taking a beating. And I go, what, uh, what's up with the uh, TRT? What's up with that uh, hormone therapy? He's like, you're a candidate, you know, you're 40 years old, uh, you don't need it, you need it if you want to continue being you, that was his exact words, he said, you absolutely don't need hormones, by any stretch, you need hormones if you want to continue being you, what he meant by that is like, you want to continue letting 25 year old gnarly dudes choke you, on purpose and then get head kicked uh, and do two hours of Muay Thai and then also lift weights three, four days a week and then be an active, happy dad and then blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. You 
22, you could have done it easy. But you want you want to continue doing that? Got to get on the juice. It's my long-winded way of saying, like, if you want to be a six-year-old guy that has the idea of building muscle at 60, you can't fucking, can't fuck with Mother Nature. Go to the endocrinologist and get yourself some testosterone and some growth hormone. You could do it. If you want to be just a happy, healthy 60-year-old, don't worry about it. But understand that being a happy, healthy 60-year-old doesn't include getting jacked. Doesn't include remaining lean and and fucking being that dude that we all see on Instagram nowadays who has gray hair but looks amazing. And you could sit here and say all you want. And listen, you can't bullshit the, the, this guy. I know. There's guys like Steve Maxwell and, and I, I, others that come to mind that I know. I know Steve personally. He's 65 or some shit, in great shape. Big, full muscles, lean, no testosterone. I know. I, Steve is zero, it's all natural. Here's the thing. He was super jacked 40 years ago and maintained it, if not increased it, all the way up into his 60s. So if you, you know, if I wanted to stay natty my whole life, and then I got to be 60, if I were to keep training and doing that, yes, I probably would still be able to qualify as really impressive 60-year-old. But that's not most of us. And if you're just like, you still got like a pooch a little bit, uh, if you're feeling listless and tired, and you haven't, you weren't the first um, American to be certified as a kettlebell instructor like Steve Maxwell and then owned your own gym in the 90s and was 4% body fat and shit. You know, if you're a regular dude and you're 60 and now you want to continue living that lifestyle or, or, or begin living that lifestyle, go to the doctor. You are what TRT's invented for. You 30-year-old guys who like to drink beer every night and go to the clubs and not sleep and not train very hard, and then you're like, you know what I can do? I can go to the doctor and get TRT, blah, 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 blah. No. Pull your shit together. 60-year-old guys or people with some type of medical biological condition that has that makes it so that you necessitate exogenous hormones, that's what therapy is for. It's therapeutic. That ain't cheating. It's not, it's not selling out. You earn this. You deserve to have what you want. You deserve to be 60 years old, 60 years old and setting PRs. You deserve to be 60 years old and, and, and putting the 25-year-olds at the, at the beach to shame when you take off your shirt. You deserve that. Just know that you also have to deal with reality and that your hormones aren't going to let you do that. Russ Coke. What is the most accurate way to find your maintenance calories? I use the TDEE calculator, but I still feel hungry a lot on a 500 calorie deficit and I worry that I may be under eating. Thanks. Uh, well, Russ, it's a good question because there's like four or five different reputable equations people use. But it's really, none of them are accurate. Here's why. All of them do a great job of putting you in the neighborhood. But it's really hard because a lot of it has to do with lifestyle. And you factor it in. It's like put, you know, times it by 0.5 if you're very active. Times it by 0.1 if you're lightly active. That, that's really vague. What's really active? What's not? What's really active for you and your meta metabolic rate and your fucking hormone profile? So there's a, these are factors that make it, you know, sometimes the margins can be really wide. The only truly accurate way, and I hate saying this because it sucks my butt, the only truly accurate way to know your metabolic activity and output is to detail give a detailed tracking of everything you eat every single calorie staying and again I'm not gonna lie to you sucks my ass 
staying at an exact calorie rate, uh, you know, within a couple hundred calories, give or take, the exact same calories for at least two two weeks, and weighing yourself. And if you do two thousand calories and you stay there and you're committed and you really you don't fuck it up and you don't don't lose a pound, you found it. If you lose a lot of weight, you probably didn't. You're a little under. If you gain weight, you definitely didn't find it. You are a little over. How much weight you gain, it, how much weight or how much weight you lose will kind of give you a better idea of how close you were to your resting metabolic rate. If you're losing two, three pounds a week, you you grossly underestimated how many calories you, you should eat. If you are gaining two to three pounds in a week, you are grossly overestimating. 0.5 to one pound a week is a good marker. This gets weird when you're extremely obese. Okay? If you're over 100 pounds overweight, I would say, you know, look, if you're over 75 pounds overweight, um, you're going to lose a lot of weight just by any level of de- uh, deficit right out of the gate. So it's kind of harder when you're when you're dealing with that situation. But if you stay, if you if you can maintain a exact caloric cap for two weeks, and you stay exactly the same or within a, like I said, within a pound or two, you know you got it, you got it. But that takes rigorous discipline tracking. Okay, so you can use, um, you can use those equations. They are useful, but use them as a guide. Now, to get to your other thing, I, I. I I still feel hungry a lot on a 500 calorie deficit. No shit. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think pretty much everyone is heavier than they want to be? Or um, smoother or, or having more body fat percentage than they want? There's There's an absolute level of discomfort to dieting. So don't say, I feel like I'm hungry a lot, therefore I'm not eating enough. No. If you're, especially if you're an active person that tr- really, truly trains, you're going to be hungry. It's made a lot worse if you're doing a lot of cardio. One of the main reasons why I'm not a um, tremendous fan. Um... You got any tips and tricks to help with ankle mobility from Zachary Widgerin? Trying to get into those low squats and got my hips where they need to be. But now my ankles are holding me up. Yes. Work on the entirety of the musculature below your knee all the way down to your to your heel. That includes the, the calves, obviously, and the but also the, the, the soleus muscles in the front of the shin. Um, really work on getting those to be functional through a larger range of motion. Um, reverse hypers. Is that what they're called? Whatever they're fucking called. I'll put up a video of what I'm talking about. Are also going to create a lot of mobility in the knees, which is great. But then it's also going to keep those soleus uh, working healthy. I do them so much. And it just gets you to be able to put your your foot and your shin bone should be able to go flat pretty much. Um, and then also, don't do it before training. But when you are about to squat, here's a little tip. And I'm not talking like calf training. But do a couple sets of standing calf raises while you're holding the bottom position. Don't go too heavy. Don't do too much volume. Just a couple sets with a, 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 a weight that you can comfortably do 10 to 20 reps with. And on every rep, hold that bottom position. And then go up and contract like you were training them. But just don't use too much weight to the point that you're going to fatigue your calves. What does this do? It creates a lot more... Um, It creates a lot more circulation into the calf muscles, right? But also, it's creating a more safe and also a warmer, literal temperature um, and and safer and 
warmer environment for the connective tissue in the bottom of the ankle, like your Achilles area. And if you do that before you squat, it actually will help you um, in your ability to kind of find that ankle mobility. Here's another thing. Also falls into the category of either warm-up or something that you do away from your actual squat training. Start with your heel very elevated, okay? Put plates, put a slant board behind. Heel is super elevated. And just go down, right? Hang out in that ass to grass squat. Feel your hamstrings resting against your calves, okay? Practice that. Get good at it. When it's comfortable, you're, you're, you're right. Then lower that elevation of your heel a little bit. It's a progression. Progression just like you would with adding weight to a, a, a exercise you could do comfortably, right? You, you can do six reps with 225. Time to go to 235. So this is the same thing. You lower that elevation. And then when you can get comfortable at two plates underneath, you know, two 10-pound plates underneath your heel, then you go to one plate. Do that. And it's, look, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But if you have the discipline to do that and work the progressions of heel elevated ass to grass squats, your body will adapt and you will be able to comfortably get full ass to grass. Wolves within 444. Yo, I'm 35 years old. Great testosterone levels. Best ways to defeat stubborn belly fat. Dieting. It's the best way. It's the only way. Find your caloric set point. We already talked about it earlier in the show. Find a slight deficit from that. Train your ass off. Three, maybe four days a week. Don't look to exercise as a way of getting the deficit. Look to diet. Continue training like you're trying to get jacked, but just find a deficit. Don't worry about burning calories. That's where everybody gets in this vicious fucking cycle where they're starving and they're starving for all the wrong shit. And then they think, well, I burned a thousand calories on my treadmill. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to eat cake. No, no, fuck that. You want it for reals? Real visceral body fat loss. Not my face is thinner. I got a little definition in my arms. You want six pack abs. Give up on the idea of I'm going to run a marathon to get there. I'm going to do CrossFit. No, diet. Suck it up. Ditch the treadmill and your, your goddamn exercise bike and your elliptical. Get in. Hit the iron hard. Three to four days a week. 45 minutes to an hour. And diet. Up your protein. Lower your calories. 300 at first. And do that for a long time. Belly fat for men and, you know, glute and thigh and and kind of like upper pelvic you know, fupa region for women it takes fucking a long time it takes a long time you will lose weight in your face you will lose weight in your upper arms and your lower legs and pretty quickly you start to see some definition in your chest guys do oftentimes or upper chest uh but you're like ah oh, but i still have a spare tire yeah no shit that's biology it takes a long time all right dude and that goes for a 35-year-old, that goes for a 75-year-old, that goes for a 25-year-old, that goes for a teenager. If you, and I mean, I don't like to encourage teenagers to like really diet, but my point being is that that's biology. You really want to get stubborn belly fat gone, you got to do it. You got to do the damn thing and you got to do it for a prolonged period of time. And that's where everybody kind of misses out on it. And, and, and look, there is no supplement, there is no secret training plan, there is no blah, blah, blah. The reality is, is like it's just a matter of consistency over the long haul. All right, I recently got a Patreon-based question and it was in a DM, so I'm not even gonna ne necessarily mention the names. Uh, it's not re relevant, but it was a question about traps, developing traps. And uh, as I point out in this video, the best way to develop your traps is really good form and really heavy deadlifts. It really is. But if you're needing something more, Especially because traps are one of those really marquee muscle groups that really separates people. You see a good set of traps and, and like, you know, neck, you, you know that homie lifts. Um, the godfather of bodybuilding, Charles Glass, showed me a great little tweak on a very common trap exercise 
that absolutely makes a big difference. I've never received such a great trap contraction, and um, I think it has definitely helped me. So I put a little video together to demonstrate it as opposed to just explaining it. Here you go. And remember, in this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares, I do. Be good. Well, hello everybody, okay? I wanna talk traps. Um, maybe not necessarily for women because the female physique isn't really all that pleasing with super well-developed traps, um, at least in the, in the eyes of most women, but for men, it is the part of the upper body because legs is really what separates people. Only real G's train their legs are. But in the upper body, it is the number one way to separate yourself from the do you even lift bro guys, okay? And traps, like I said, are very, very well respected, very well sought after, but they're super misunderstood. Let me get this out right now. I think that the number one way to completely develop your traps is heavy deadlifts with really good form. Okay, that's, that's the number one way to put on mass in the complete trap, the middle, lower, and upper trap. But if you're not getting the results you want, I learned a little trick. It's a tweak on a very common trap exercise. And I learned this from the godfather of bodybuilding himself, Mr. Charles Glass. I saw him training a professional bodybuilder, which he is very commonly doing back in Venice Beach, at Gold's Gym, at the Mecca. And I saw him doing this exercise. And I talked to him a little bit about it, and I wanna show it to you guys. It is a regular dumbbell or kettlebell if you're like me, and uh, it is a regular shrug. But the small tweak makes a huge difference. Okay, so instead of just going straight up and down, you want to, as you come up, externally rotate the wrists and bring the elbows outward, holding that pause at the top. And it gives you a better range of motion and a better squeeze, uh, it essentially gives the upper trap more room to move, stretch, and contract, which is the basis for all uh, resistance training, is stretching and contracting the target muscle with more and more resistance. Hold that squeeze for at least a second or two up at the top, and like I said, you're externally rotating the wrist and giving your elbows a little bit more room outward to get that trap to squeeze. And I'll go to failure and then usually do a drop set. But also, another one reason, another reason why I really like these is because they can be done in the gym, they can be done at home, and you can use a band as well. So uh, this band doesn't have too much resistance. So it makes for a great drop set. And I'm not uh, clearly using very much weight. Uh, and that's a, a great tip to develop the upper traps. As you can tell, look, I'll, I'll barbell shrug, 315, 365, stuff like that. That was, I think those are 32 pound kettlebells. And then the red little red band, not exactly a lot of resistance, but my traps are fried right now from just doing one drop set. So I wanted to pass along that tip to you because like I said, I know that most of you dudes out there are like, dude, I just, I saw, I saw Warrior the other day, bro. You see Tom Hardy's traps? You, you ever seen Tom Hardy as Bane? There's a fucking trap. Eh? And I don't have the best traps in the world, but I definitely have noticed a, 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 a spurt of growth from working these in. So, much like glutes, calves, forearms, traps are not a big muscle, but they're really, really tough. So you can get away with training them a little bit more frequently with a little bit more volume. I like to do these two or three days a week, typically after deadlifting or um, alongside some shoulder training. So there you go. Do the dumbbell or kettlebell shrug, outwardly rotate those wrists, Give your elbows a little bit more room. Don't keep them tight to you. Give them a little bit more room, almost like you're doing like a, preparing to do a, a snatch or something like that. And just elevate the elbows as you elevate your shoulder caps. All right, man? All right, lady? <laughs> there you go.